Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. Just a reminder, just my newsletter at jasonperera.ca will get a notification of all my podcasts, blog posts, and other goings on. Now, on today's show. Today on the show, I have Ryan Malone, Director of Provincial Affairs for Ontario for the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. The CFIB is the largest advocacy group for small business owners in Canada, and I brought them on to discuss what it is they do and why small business owners should consider becoming members. With that, here's my interview with Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Thanks for taking the time today. Hey, thanks for having me. A pleasure. So, Ryan Malo of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business Owners, tell us about the CFIB and what it is you do. Yeah, so the Canadian Federation of Independent Business has been around for 49 years now, and we represent the big voice for small businesses. We operate across the country. We've got offices in all 10 provinces, uh, as well as an additional one at Ottawa. We advocate for things that that small businesses are looking for. So things like uh, reduced small business or corporate tax rates, changes to employment standards law, uh, cutting red tape and regulations, permit, signage, that sort of thing. So we advocate for for things like that across all three levels of government. And we're informed by our members' opinions. As much as I I have my own opinions and I would love to share them with politicians, we make sure that the views we we are representing are our members. And we do that through regular surveys and mandate questions. So we do our best to take our members' pulse. During COVID, we're doing it weekly. We put out a survey on a Friday afternoon and on Monday, we're briefing officials with the data. So we advocate really on that principle and whatever it is that small business owners are looking for, that's what we'll push for with governments. The second thing that we do, because we have 110,000 members, we do have a a fair bit of purchasing power when it comes to operating as a collective. So we do operate a number of saving programs for businesses on things like payroll software, or uh, payment uh, credit card processing, uh, payment modules, that sort of thing, insurance programs as well. And we pass on 100% of the savings on to our members because we're, we're a not-for-profit. And then the final one, which is, I think, sort of our, not necessarily a secret, but certainly one of the best things that we do is we offer what we call a business resources service. And what this is, is a hotline that business owners can call into and ask any question under the sun, be it, I have an employee who's going on mat leave, how do I go through the EI process? to the CRA is auditing me, what do I need to do, to, hey, the government just changed that labor law, what is it? And they can call in with those questions, an expert will pick up the line, and they will they will answer the question for them, or if they can't on the spot, they will dig to the answer for them. So instead of the business owner having to spend you know 40 minutes on hold with CRA, we'll do that on your behalf, because we know that business owners have to get back to running their business, they really don't have the time to do it. And 40 I, minutes I, I, on, on hold with CRA to get the wrong answer in most cases, unfortunately. That's, <laughs> that's exactly it, which yeah. we do a, a biannual report card. We know, we know CRA's failings uh, quite well. Despite um, their, their contrary opinions, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that hotline during COVID has been, has been really significant for us to the point where normally this is a service that we only offer members. We've opened it up to every business owner in the country in recognition that yeah. they do have issues and they are looking for answers and information is changing quickly. So I'll say a normal day for us across the country is maybe 80 to 100 calls. During COVID, we're up to 800 to 1,000 calls a day. Oh my gosh. Um, so we've ex- expanded the staff, taking them from 30 to 90. But it is, it is a huge service and one where we, we provide, we hope, not only the information business owners are looking for, but also some peace of mind that uh, you're getting a consistent answer from someone and someone can walk you through what it is you should be doing on the ground. Excellent. So really what you are is your collective of a bunch of independent businesses who do not have the market, the not the lobbying clout or the buying power that a major Fortune 500 would. And you get to basically get to go to Ottawa and say, hey, this is the number of our membership. So therefore you should be listening to us. So before we talk about you know some of the logistics of this, like let's talk about what it is you guys have done in the past and some of the big wins. And I was I I mean that big wins you've made on behalf of the Canadian business owner. Sure. So the one that people may be most familiar with recently is uh, in the summer of 2017, the federal government announced that they were going to make some pretty significant tax changes and changes to the way that uh, business owners are to structure their business, how you can pay family members. And I mean, that the, the line that everyone will remember is the, the prime minister during the campaign indicated that, you know, a lot of people use the small business uh, 
corporate tax structure to cheat their taxes and implied that Mm -hmm. small business owners were tax cheats. And of course, our our 110,000 members did not take that sitting down. Yes, Um, as the man who never owned a business in his life. Yes, let's continue. (laughs) (laughs) And and, they were rightfully, you know, offended and, and pretty irate at the statement. But also, you know, this was a a direct attack on their livelihoods. I mean, they, they structure their business and, you know, oftentimes a, a spouse is an integral part of the business, but may not be a officially payrolled employee, but they do find a way to pay them under the way the structure was. And the government was looking to change that. So we, we pushed back extremely hard on that, gave the, the finance minister a heck of a time on the summer barbecue circuit, I think, and we're able to get them to not fully walk it back, but able to abandon a couple of their changes, walk back a few of the other ones. That's still a bit of an ongoing one for us, but that was one of our, our recent major fights. For those in Ontario, they would be familiar with in the last year of the Wynn government, uh, they made some substantial changes to employment standards and labor laws, including the promise of a $15 minimum wage, paid mm-hmm. sick days, uh, as well as some pretty significant uh, paperwork requirements when it came to scheduling. So we, we fought back hard against those and, and were able to secure the Ford government's commitment to walk back a lot of those rules, and in particular, the, the scheduling rules, which would have required a business owner to indicate down to the minute the time that they changed or canceled the shift of the threat of a fine for not having that paperwork for five years, sort of a one of those silly Perhaps government rules that I'm sure, uh, like, yeah, it's one of those things that I think a bureaucrat in a, in a closed room thinks, you know, this this makes a lot of sense. And then when you apply it to the real world, you can find out pretty quickly that it really doesn't work in uh, in practice. No, they, it seems like they've got a very, very poor understanding of what it is to actually run a business and that they seem to think that it's all this logistically planned out stuff. And meanwhile, the vast majority of small businesses are nothing but putting out fires most of the days for the owners, right? Like you know, the a well, even a well-organized business, it's just a matter of making sure it doesn't fall off the track, right? So it's putting these kinds of burdens on on the average Canadian business owner is just, you know, it's, it's delusional, quite honestly. Yeah. And, and with the exceptions of perhaps a, an HR business or an accountant, no one really starts up a business to navigate the CRA or to no. uh, figure out how to be an HR specialist, right? You start a business because you want to be your own boss. You've got something that you you want to do or that you love to do, and you go and pursue it. So that's really where we see our role is how how can we help the business owners succeed? How can we make their life easier when it comes to dealing with government, uh, while at the same time ensuring that government understands the realities of running a small business? Which they clearly don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be honest. I mean, I mean, the reality is, is that some of the tax policy, which you named some of it is, is just, you look at what they were trying to accomplish with that. And it's clear that they didn't really have an understanding for how this was being used in, in the real world or what, what it really meant to run a business. You look at some of the stuff that they put in terms of red tape and barriers to, when you hear certain organizations or certain politicians talk about burden reduction and, and loosening red tape, you know, people think, oh, just go let businesses run all over people. But, you know, I think, you know, people need to take a step back and take a, remember that these are your neighbors. These are these are maybe your family members. Like they're not going out there trying to basically screw the government for taxes or abuse their employees. But there's unfortunately a lowest common denominator approach to governance that basically says that we just have to assume that everybody's going to try the worst thing because this one guy got away with it. So this one guy got away with it. Therefore, we have to make sure no one can ever do that again. Whereas you know the 99 percent of us are left saying like. Come on, now you just increased my cost because of this one case. It's a tough one. I mean, you guys also can claim, you've been around for a long time, as you said earlier, and you can claim a lot of other advocacy wins. I mean, my understanding is uh, we have we have you guys to thank for the capital gains exemption on small business sales. Is that correct? Yep. That's something that we we fought very hard for and we uh, we like it where it is, but we're trying to trying to extend it as well. I think for the uh, the average business owner now, it's in the $800,000 plus range. Mm-hmm. And for farmers and fisheries, it's at the million. We would like to see it get up to the million for for business owners as well. And that largely comes out of the fact that as an employee, I pay into CPP, my employer pays into CPP. As a business owner, you tend not to get that or you're you're doubling up on your own if you are paying into it. But oftentimes your retirement fund is the years that you put into the business. So having that capital gains exemption is, is crucial for that. Now, there are still a lot of, I mean, succession is obviously a, a big issue for our members, especially as the, the boomer cohort gets close to retiring. So there is, are still some things in the system to work out there. The the one that we are hoping to see movement on as soon as possible, and obviously COVID's thrown a bit of a wrench into to timing, but right now in Canada, it is easier and 
more lucrative from a tax perspective mm-hmm. to sell to a third party than it is to sell to a family member. So, so a lot of our business, I know it well. Uh, and and it's crazy, right? It makes it makes no sense. I don't think anybody would volunteer that that is what the case is if they had to make a guess at it. And yet when you're going through the tax code, that really is the case. Uh, for a, a, a business to stay in the family, it's a, a bigger hit on the parent passing yeah. it down to a child uh, than it is to sell to a third party. And just to provide some background, typically what we're getting at, what the government's getting at is, um, you know, if a third party comes along and they've got a bunch of money, they got a business and they got a bunch of money in that business, they paid small business tax rates on it, and then they can buy another corporation uh, that's at arm's length and not have to pay personal income tax on that. If you're starting to use someone at arm's length, then you've got a problem, right? They're basically saying you're, oh, wait a sec, you didn't pay personal income tax on this. And now you're giving it to your family members. So therefore, that's not going to work. Like, it's a bit of a mess, quite honestly. And it's, but I understand from a tax standpoint why they think it's unjust. But when, it, from a practicality standpoint, the finance minister took it on the chin there when, you know, I think it was Paul Avia got up and said, so my understanding is that it's actually, I was meeting with a farmer who said it'll actually be cheaper for him to sell to McCain, who happens to be his in-laws, than it would be to his own son. And, you know, the finance minister said, that's absolutely not true, to which I stood up and said, you have, while at home saying, you have no idea what the tax code says, because it absolutely is true, unfortunately. And unfortunately, the people making these policies don't often know. So yeah, that's a big concern, quite honestly, because it's just, (laughs) why would you ever in a society want that to be the case? It just doesn't make any sense. So that's one of your big issues right now. COVID is one of your big issues. Tell me what your other pressing concerns and advocacy issues are right now for, for your membership. So heading, I mean, before COVID broke, and obviously that's that's taken, rightfully so, has taken front and center. But before COVID broke, electricity costs and, and generation were a, a big one, especially here in Ontario. The way we price electricity in Ontario is kind of crazy, where it's not based on the amount you use, but based on the time of day that you use it, yeah. which as a resident might sound really good. You know, you can do your laundry at 9 p.m. if you really want to. But as a business owner, it makes life really hard. I mean, you, you uh, find peak hours tend to be in the middle of the day. And if you're, say, yeah. a, a restaurant dealing with the lunch rush, well, all the ovens and everything are on in the middle of the day because that's when customers are uh, coming in. You know, you don't make pizzas at four in the morning to serve at two in the afternoon sort of thing. So that was something that we were looking to to press the government on. The small business corporate tax rate is always an issue that we watch very closely. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, it was trending in the right direction heading into this in Ontario. And we were pressing the government to continue in that uh, right direction. We know Manitoba has a 0% rate. And that ultimately, I think, is is the goal across the country on the small business side. Yeah, that's love. interesting because some people, some people hear that. And I remember, you know, when I teach financial planning, I will often say that I'm a believer in in 0% tax rates for corporations to which I get this, like, you are like an anarchist look from my students. And I explain it. I mean, like, and I will explain, we've talked about this in the podcast before, but in reality, what do business owners do with cash in a corporation? They either A, hire more people, B, who then pay taxes, B, buy more equipment, who then those companies then pay taxes, C, pay themselves more. And then the top marginal rate on Ontario is 53.53. So they pay a lot of taxes. They pay a dividend, which again, taxes. And then the last part of it is that maybe they invest it in non-business assets, which in which case there's passive, you know, that, that was even before the passive uh, tax changes, that was taxed at 50 plus percent. So to take money off the table after operations, after everything's done from a business owner is just a way of reducing the expansionary effects of what that business owner can do with that money. And that benefits all of society and the tax and the tax base. But it's always easier to say, well, corporations don't pay their fair share of tax because I'm not a corporation and therefore I want to pay less, right? It's, it is what it is. Anyway, there's my rant. <laughs> so, so that was moving in the right direction. Good on you there. What it was, so, so the tax rates, any other big pressing concerns lately? The other big one, which is, is near and dear to me because I live in downtown Toronto, uh, about a block south from where they're building the new LRT line. So I pass mm. those businesses every day having to deal with oh that construction. Oh my God, they're day. getting crushed. They're getting absolutely crushed. And COVID was the, the last thing anybody needed. But certainly these businesses, if they weren't already uh, sort of right on the doorstep, they, they certainly are now. So one of the things that we've been pushing for, for all governments across the country to do is to start building in construction mitigation programs, including financial compensation for businesses that are disrupted by these monster construction projects. Mm-hmm. We actually got success. Montreal, Quebec City, and the township of Levi, which sits in between the two, all three of them in Quebec have adopted these sort of programs where businesses who see uh, massive disruption or 
forced closure or, you know, see streets shut down for long periods of time because of construction are financially compensated. And if you talk to any of these businesses here in Toronto that are along that construction line, that could have been a saving grace for them because they are, yeah. at best, they are covered in scaffolding and it's hard to get to. At worst, they're being avoided uh, entirely. And I mean, the phrase avoid Eglinton to a Toronto person, it's, it's almost a catchphrase at this point. Everybody knows you avoid Eglinton right now which is really rough for those businesses. And it's such a it's such an unfair dichotomy because right like if your business that was in that area that was popular before making that area what it was paying taxes doing everything right they come along and they do an expansionary project which is you know arguably good for the betterment of the city long run it's going to drive more traffic there and be good for business long run. However, you risk bankrupting all the people who were there first only to basically have them, when this is done, replaced by a bunch of new businesses who get the benefit from that, even though they weren't there for the 20, 30 years some of these other businesses were. So I often say like it's the same thing with COVID. You don't want to be in a situation where anyone who was, you know, I'll use restaurants, for example, anyone who was thinking about getting into the restaurant business before this and sitting on the cash is basically going, well, hey, you know what? All these bankruptcies of, of restaurants is going to mean less competition for me down the road. I mean, this is not conducive to the, you know, don't get me wrong. Things happen, disasters happen, but in the sense of justice, it's not right. And if we're yeah, going to- and, and from a community standpoint too, it gets really rough. I mean, we've seen a few, uh, a few city institutions go down now because of COVID. And when we were talking about the LRT, I mean, you see entire neighborhoods kind of get decimated. And, and will those storefronts always be empty? No, businesses will come in and replace, especially when the project is done. There's likely to be a bit of gentrification that goes on there. You're going to get a few more chain stores coming into the area. Yeah. Some people will like that, some people won't. But it's every time a business in your on your main street or in your neighborhood closes, you lose a little bit of the business's soul. Or the sorry, you lose a little bit of the neighborhood soul. It's part of what knits our community together are the places that we we gather. And those really are your local coffee shops, your restaurants, your yeah. stores. It's hard to think of a neighborhood anywhere that isn't defined by the businesses in it. Your Little Italy, your Little Portugal, Kensington Market in Toronto, those yeah. areas are all, they're defined by the people, but they're defined by the businesses in those areas. You take them out and you'd be hard pressed to recognize where you are. Yeah. And it's one thing for a business to be taken out by their lack of ability to make it for whatever reason. It's something else entirely for a government to come in and say, we're going to lay down some tracks in the next couple, and we're going to rip up this road for the next three years and do nothing to help. Like that is tyranny in a way. And I can get and, into a rant there, but. And you're, you're lucky if it's three years. I mean, one of the other frustrations uh, is the government comes in and says, here's a project and the business owner goes, okay, I don't love it, but three years, I can tighten the belt a little bit. It'll be good when it's done. We'll make it. Two years into the project, you're getting another three years tacked onto the timeline. Another three years after that. And I mean, I always go back to, I'm pretty sure Union Station in Toronto was supposed to be finished for the Pan Am Games. Oh, the big dig? Oh, that was hilarious. That was, yeah, that was five there. years ago. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, and still they're still happen. working on the. They're still working on the second half. Yeah, it's notoriously the mechanical rabbit of of large scale projects. These things never get done in time. So uh, yeah, so good. I'm glad to see some cities are moving on that. Hopefully, others will. I mean, it doesn't have to be enriching the business. It has to be allowing them to survive. Kind of like how we're triaging the the entire economy now. So. Tell me what you've done on the COVID front specifically. Have you had to engage government? I mean, I'm guessing some of the business policies on COVID have been less than satisfactory to me and others. Uh, you know, let's talk about what efforts you've done there to lobby on, on business behalf. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a pretty all hands on deck, multifaceted conversation on our end between provincial governments, federal government and municipal governments. So on, on the federal side, we're we're glad to see that we have the the number of programs that we do. I mean, I, I you certainly have to give credit to a federal government that is not used to making policy quickly by anyone's standards. For them, they're mm. operating at light speed. That being said, you can sort of have highly detailed policy or fast policy. I don't think any government can really deliver both. So what we're getting is fast and not oftentimes a an announcement will drop and the details will come two weeks later. Or for example, on the wage subsidy, I think we got the details and seven weeks before money started actually flowing on that. And it's mm -hmm. rough for business owners because they're making decisions in real time. And if you know money is promised on the first of the month, but not delivered till the first of the next month, that's a whole month that they're trying to figure out how to how to stay afloat before funds come in. So we were uh, pushing initially for a wage subsidy. We were glad when the feds announced the 10%, but it was immediately clear that that wasn't going to be remotely enough no. to actually change anyone's mind when it came to, to making layoff decisions. So glad that they went to 75. Money has only just started to flow from that. I think Thursday, May 7th mm -hmm. was the first day uh, money started to go on that. So we're sort of in a, a wait and see pattern now to see uh, 
how that plays out. I think there are still kinks to be worked out. Uh, we were super glad to see that they are going to extend the program. I think the initial three month window mm-hmm. is uh, it, well, it's quickly closing. It was, was always going to be too short. We've heard that the uh, the emergency business account, the bank loan, is is very popular. That being said, we also have a number of, in particular, sole proprietors. But any business owner that's paying themselves uh, on a dividend is also finding a lot of frustration in accessing these programs. Yes. Yeah. That's been a huge frustration, and again, it's been a it's been a back and forth. But our our main goal is to make these all of these programs as broadly accessible as possible to as many businesses as possible. Because when we do finally get to full reopenings, we want to make sure that as many businesses are able to to be there to reopen as possible. And if these programs are too narrow, if money doesn't start flowing soon enough, more and more businesses close their doors and never come back. Yeah, I mean, I have several issues with some of these programs, including the metrics they use for when you qualify in particular. I mean, like a 30% revenue drop is, is a very big number. And especially, you know, when they first announced it, it was, it was from previous years. So if you were in a rapid expansion phase, that meant nothing to you. Beyond that, I mean, there's tons of businesses out there that are narrow margin just by their nature. Uh, food distribution, for one, comes to mind. And, you know, you're talking about companies that have 2 to 4% margins, 30% drops in revenues. Like, you want them to keep their, you want them to keep their, their staff on payroll. Like, that you're, that's essentially a 20 plus percent loss. Like, that's not going to happen. So, I, you know, I, for one, almost wish that, I really wish they had just been a little bit, I never, I never say this, looser with the purse strings and then basically just tax it back if you didn't need it. Like, to me, that would have been a more turn the hose on and worry about it later solution, but at least a little bit more, you wouldn't miss as many people, in my opinion. Yeah, um, and, and so how- we saw that with CERB, right? Like the uh, the Canada yeah. Emergency Response Benefit has very much been a, if you apply, you'll get it. But if we find out you shouldn't have applied, we will come back and take it from you. Just yeah. not immediately because we're oh, more worried about getting the help out now. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's definitely been abuse of that. I know of people asking me like, well, you know, my neighbor's got it and they're still getting, you know, they're still working. It's like, well, that's nice. They're going to pay back 100% of that and maybe penalties by the time this is all done. And I would rather not be on the wrong side of this legislation when it comes out. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Um, yep. How about the feedback on the commercial uh, real estate uh, subsidies that are going on? The, I mean, that one to me has been, oh, I'll, let me, I'll let you go first and I'll give you my opinion afterwards. <laughs> so... Once the feds had sorted out wage subsidy, that, that was the, the original the original largest concern that our members had was, was cost of labor. And if I'm going to try to keep my employees on while making little to no revenue, I need help. How do I go about that? Once we got through that, it became immediately clear that the next biggest cost and the bill that was quickly coming up was rent. We needed them to move. We needed someone to move on rent. And, I, and with CFIB, we were talking to the feds, but we were very much going after the provinces at this point to help cover that because the feds did step up on the wage subsidy side. Hey, provinces, we need something. We were glad to see that in partnership, the feds and the provinces were able to come together with a program. And the program, the idea of the program is good. People need rent help. Here is money for it. The execution of the program and the actual how it has played out. Well, I say how it's played out, how it's playing out initially because the application process actually isn't open yet, but how it is playing out now has been, I don't want to say universal, but just resoundingly, resounding disappointment from our members. And for the most part, it's from the tenant side, it's my landlord does not want to play ball here, which has been a concern. From the tenants or from the landlord side, it has very much been a case of either I can't afford to eat 25%, which is what I'm being asked to do here, ultimately, which is a problem, or the paperwork, the amount of, of information that I need to collect as a landlord and the rigor role that I have to go through is not going to be worth it to me. Which if that is is the case, or if the landlord is just saying no, just because as a tenant, you're in an impossible position now because you've already established you need the program. You can't pay rent. If your landlord isn't playing ball, there is no program for you. There is no exactly. way to cover these costs. And in, at the very least in Ontario, they don't need the court to evict you. In Ontario, a landlord can evict you without a court order. They, they got to wait uh, 16 days after delayed payment. But after that, they can put a lock on the door, which we have heard uh, from across the province is happening, not at a huge level, but it is happening on the ground. So it's it's a an issue that has come up before the program has even been rolled out that we are trying to get addressed immediately yeah. because as is, this program is not going to work. I mean, I'm utterly frustrated at the fact that they're seeming to jump through hoops to not directly pay business owners. I mean, with the exception of the emergency account, uh, benefit account, or sorry, the emergency uh, business account, 
uh, for 40,000, which they'll forgive up to 10,000 on if it's all paid off. They seem to be doing everything they can to not to repay pay business owners. They, you know, the subsidy on wages is coming through. Okay, don't pay us as much as you're supposed to in payroll tax. So, you know, you already had the money. We're not going to give it, you know, we're not going to take it from you. And now this one, where literally they will do forgivable loans to the landlords. Why in God's name is not, it's not a forgivable loan to the business owner who could then basically, if they prove that they use an equivalent amount for the rent, basically, even if you just could cover 75%, do something. But this is just literally find a way to make an excuse. And the problem is too, is that I think there was surveys that said something like one in one in five landlords is not playing ball on this when it was surveyed. And I've even seen long emails of people drafting saying, I'm not participating in this. They want me to take a haircut. You can either pay it all, you can leave. And don't kid yourself. There's landlords who are going to use this to get rid of some tenants they didn't want to have in the first place or they wanted to get rid of, and now they have an excuse. So this is, you know, execution, just again, because it seems like they're trying to do everything they can not to just cut the checks to the business owners. It's just frustrating. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we're pushing on them to do now is, is if you were going to pay 50% of the rent anyway, just send the money straight to the tenant. That's Let it. them have to figure out the other 50% with their landlord and how that's going to go. But you had the money earmarked to go anyway. If the landlord doesn't want to play ball, the tenant can prove it's rent money send it to the tenant. And I mean, at least it's something for them. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, between that and the 40 K maybe a BDC loan, which we talked about earlier and is taking very, very long to get approved or their own money. I mean, at least you're giving them a fighting chance. Yeah. And that's all they're looking for. No one is asking you to, to replace the, the revenue or uh, profit of a business at this point. They, they understand the difficult situation that we're all in. I mean, they've a lot of business owners that aren't happy about being shut down, but they understand for you know safety reasons and the, the good of society that this is what was required. But give them a chance to come back. Give them a chance to be yep. there when this is over and then fight for their life. That's all they're asking for. And are some go- not going to make it? Unfortunately, no, not everyone is going to make it. But we owe it, we, we governments, we CFIB as an advocacy group, owe it to them to give them the opportunity to try yeah, I think it just speaks to their attitude of thinking that everyone who owns a commercial building is is super rich. Like it's not not the case, right? And no, not at you all. Can't you can't really make that get claim. In fact, I'm sure some of your members are specifically landlords and you know are not voicing their their ple- that they're pleased with this right now. Yeah, so, yeah, about about ten percent of our members are landlords, and they are also you know, not particularly thrilled with the program. No, this is uh, unfortunately I know far too many who are far too many businesses who are basically getting either a runaround on this, or the business owner, the, the landlord is thinking about it, or the landlord's outright rejected it. So it's not great. So all right. We talked about the advocacy side. Um, you do have all this buying power for for discounts as well. Any other any other ancillary benefits beyond the fact that you are the voice of Canadian small business? So I, I think the other big one for us is that uh, that business resources hotline, yep. especially in a, in a time like COVID. I mean, stuff changes so fast. You go from <laughs> being closed to being open almost overnight in some jurisdictions, not a lot of, of prep time. The program eligibility might change. The prime minister and premiers are giving press conferences daily at this point. So there's always something new. One of the things that we do is we we help bring all of that information from all different sources into one place and to the best of our ability, make it easily digestible. And we do that through, through of course, through our website. But then if you've got questions about it, we've got a hotline that you can call. If someone doesn't pick up live, someone will get back to you uh, ASAP and then the time that you need on the phone to be walked through it. We do, we've gone through eligibility requirements for things like the, the wage subsidy or the uh, emergency bank loan. We've gone through the essential businesses list. I personally made probably three or four dozen calls to the Ontario Essential Businesses Hotline on behalf mm-hmm. of business owners to determine uh, whether or not they could be open. I probably got three or four dozen different answers from that call, which is its own its own Surprising. frustration. Point. No, it's, cite your source. It's, it's always the answer. Just give me an answer, please yes. cite your source. Yes, and not just for the information that we know, but given how quickly things are flying out there, there's also a lot of rumors that are flying around. I mean, oh I, I know uh, initially there was uh, pictures going around of tickets issued to drivers with more than one person in the car which freaked a lot of businesses out that had maybe two people in a delivery vehicle and were told they could still operate, but are now wondering, you know, do I, do I need to have a, a letter or something for my employees in case they get pulled over by the police? Well, turns out the picture was a hoax. It, it wasn't true. So we were able to pin that down and get a direct answer from government to say, you know, that there are a number of requirements, but that is not one of them. So I, again, I mentioned our average call volume on, in normal times is maybe 80 to 100 calls a day. We're up to 800 to 1,000. I think we've received around 20,000 COVID calls alone at this point. And, you know, it's, it's just a, a sign of how much businesses need that source of information. And I mean, again, 
the government may have it on six or seven different websites overall, but it's also written in government and by government and honestly, and a lot of times for government, not in a way that, you know, your general business owner can understand. So we help, we help to digest that and walk you through what it is you need to do to make sure that you're, you're compliant and then what's available to you to keep your business afloat. Excellent. So let's, uh, let's talk about what it costs to join. Uh, so if someone wants to join as a business owner and benefit from all the good work that you guys are doing, what is it going to uh, set the back? So I believe the flat rate is around between $350 and $375 on the year. You can do that in an a annual payment. You can also do it in a sort of Netflix style monthly uh, payment breakout. There's also an additional premium per employee as well, which I think is about $25 a head per employee, if I'm remembering uh-huh. correctly. In addition to that, we also do a lot of work with groups. So if you are part of a professional association or a group of businesses, we uh, do have deals in place where we'll sign up the group for a lower premium so that your your CFIB membership is sort of built into your membership with that group as well. We've had a fair bit of, of success with that. But that comes with access to absolutely everything. You have full access to all of our savings programs, unlimited calls into that hotline. We advocate on your behalf. You'll get all of our surveys. You get direct lines in if you have a Even if it's a specific concern to say you've got an issue with your municipality on a permit, there are times where we are able to to intervene on your behalf and sort of walk through exactly what's going on there or write to your municipality on your behalf to say, hey, you know, this this rule doesn't make sense or it's unfair. Let's let's work together and get a change. I will note right now, too, because we understand that that things are tough and margins are tight for a lot of businesses right now. We are offering a three month introductory membership. So it's three months free, full access to everything we've got going on. You can give us a try. Again, call into that number, uh, seek out some advice, and then three months later, see if you uh, you think we're, we're worth hanging on to and it's worth sticking around. So anybody who's unsure, I'd recommend that option as well. But yeah, I mean, for, for my money, and granted, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I do think we're worth it. I think that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, from talking to a lot of small business owners, there's, again, having access to those answers is important, but also having a voice. I mean, I think a lot of people often find that as they're focused on their business and to have to focus with, you know, not just one, but three different levels of government can be pretty daunting and a little bit overwhelming. And we're, we're here to, to do that for you. We're here to, to speak what it is you want said to government, to make sure governments listen, uh, to make sure that your voice is heard. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us, Ryan. Uh, where can people find more details on this? CFIB.ca. That's the best place to start. And everything's right there on the homepage. You'll find all the information to our our, uh, COVID resources, uh, as well as the number to call in, any sales information. You can even sign up directly through the website as well. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time, Ryan. Appreciate it. Hey, anytime. So that was my interview with Ryan Malo of the CFIB. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you consider membership because quite clearly we are all benefiting from their advocacy and should all contribute. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever's your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and SoundCloud. For more episodes, go to jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.